I can't take back what was done. I wish I could. I would give my life for Austin. October 20th, 2007. For confiscating a video game, Daniel Petrick ruthlessly murdered his mother and attempted to take his father's life. His actions were drawn from his addiction to games, but when the time came to face the consequences of his actions, it was game over for Petrick. Here are 10 kids who killed their own families reacting to life sentences. Number 10. Seth Pravacki. November 29th, 1998, Seth killed both of his parents, his brother, his brother's girlfriend, and his grandfather. Now what exactly was the motive? Born in the year 1980, Pravacki was a senior at Reith's Puffer High School in Muskegon, Michigan. His classmates described him as quiet and soft-spoken, but his parents had a different opinion about him. They noticed strange behavior by the age of 16. He would drink a lot of alcohol and was totally out of control. 1997, the year before he committed this mass murder, a court told Pravacki to attend counseling and to take his antidepressants after he was arrested for stealing beer from a store where he worked. But this didn't change anything. He had drenched his soul in alcohol, LSD, and amphetamine by this time. And before he could realize how deep his addiction was, he subconsciously wiped out his entire family. The murders occurred during Thanksgiving weekend, initially starting as an ordinary joyous evening in the Pravacki family household. However, it would take a grim turn when an intense argument erupted between Seth and his father. In the heat of the moment, his father expressed feelings of detachment, stating that Seth was no longer loved by the family and needed to keep his distance. This emotional exchange triggered something within Seth, prompting him to consume a potentially dangerous amount of LSD. As those effects sunk in, he impulsively retrieved his father's 22 Ruger handgun from the closet and concealed it behind his back as he made his way downstairs. After his father left to pick up his grandfather at 12.45 p.m., Pravacki shot his brother in the back of the head while watching TV, before dragging his dead body into the basement. Pravacki would then wait for his father to get home before ambushing him and his grandfather in the garage, shooting them both in the back of the head. He then went upstairs and shot his mother after waiting for her to get out of the shower. His brother's girlfriend, April Boss, arrived at the Pravacki residence to spend the weekend, but immediately after walking in, Seth also shot her in the head. After about 30 minutes, the effect of the drug had worn down, and Seth was slightly devastated by what he had done. He phoned a friend of his, Stephen Clayton Wallace, to help him clean up the scene, and Wallace arrived half an hour later. But while cleaning up this bloody house, the parents of his brother's girlfriend arrived at the Pravacki residence after she failed to pick up the phone. When they saw this gory mess Seth had created, they immediately called the police, leading to his arrest almost 13 hours later. May 27, 1999. Seth was given life imprisonment without parole, but he was eventually killed during a botched prison escape with two other inmates in July 2010. He died in the same fashion that all five of his victims did. Number 9. Nehemiah Grigo. Nehemiah Griego will get life for murdering his parents and three younger siblings when he was just 15 years old. January 19th, 2013. A mass shooting occurred in South Valley, New Mexico. Nehemiah Griego, a teenager, mercilessly shot and killed five of his family members between midnight and dawn. Nehemiah was stricken with suicidal and homicidal thoughts when he found two guns in his parents' closet. And on the day of the murders, he took those guns, went straight into his mother's room, and fatally shot her with a 22 rifle. The sound of the gunshot woke his brother, Zephaniah, from sleep. Nehemiah then went and told his little bro that he had killed their mother before shooting him dead with the same rifle. He would then go into the bedroom shared by his two younger sisters, who were crying at this point, knowing something just wasn't right. Relentlessly, he shot them both in the head killing him on the spot. Eventually, he would go downstairs to wait for his father to come home from a shift at a homeless shelter. When his father did come back at around 5 a.m. in the morning, Nehemiah shot him many times with an AR-15 type semi-auto rifle through a scope. Seeing that he had single-handedly wiped out more than half of his family, 
Nehemiah took the keys to the family's van, loaded it with both rifles, and drove to church. On his way there, he contacted his girlfriend and told her that his family had an accident. Now we can all see he's trying to create an alibi, but it didn't work. When he got to church, Nehemiah told the pastor that his father was dead. That prompted the pastor and another member of the congregation, a retired homicide detective, to follow Nehemiah back home. On the way, years of detective experience came into play when he sensed something was wrong. Upon getting into the house, he quickly dialed 911, leading to Nehemiah's arrest. Nehemiah was a minor, and under New Mexico law, he could be sentenced to death or life without parole. So for the first few years, his case was stalled a bit. He was first sentenced as a juvie to a youth detention facility, but this ruling was overturned to three concurrent life sentences plus seven years to run consecutively. For the most part of his trial, Nehemiah was silent, but after his sentencing, he tendered an apology to his family. I am sorry for taking our parents and our sins. I wish I could take it back. Reality is that we can't. Number 8. Sierra Halseth. 555 days credit for time served. That is a total aggregate sentence of life in the Nevada Department of Corrections with the possibility to roll up to 22 years. So it's that was the emotionless reaction of Sierra Halseth after being sentenced to life for murdering her own father. April 9th, 2021, Sierra and her boyfriend, Aaron Guerrero, conspired to murder Sierra's father, Daniel Halseth, for attempting to end their romantic relationship. This all started in 2011, when Sierra's mother, Elizabeth Helgeline, accused Halseth of abuse, leading to their divorce. At the time, Elizabeth was granted custody of Sierra. However, after a dispute in 2020, Alseth won back custody of his daughter, but it also marked the beginning of his end. While living with Halseth, Sierra met Aaron, whom she fell in love with. The duo began dating by June 2020, but barely eight months into their relationship, Halseth banned his daughter from seeing Aaron after he found out they were planning on running away to start a new life in LA. But despite warnings to his daughter to stay clear of Aaron, her love for him was so strong that she wanted nothing to come between them, not even Halseth. So he needed to go. The first stage of their plan involved stealing money from his joint account with his ex-wife. Then the day before the murder, the pair were caught on surveillance, purchasing a circular saw, saw blades, bleach, lighter fluid, disposable gloves, and drop cloth from stores near Halseth's home. On that fateful day, the lovebirds brutally stabbed Halseth 70 times before dumping his body in his garage and setting that place on fire. After that, they would steal his credit card along with his car and ride it into the sunset to start a new life in Salt Lake City. But whose fairy tale movie was this? That ending was never going to happen. April 13th, 2021. The two were finally apprehended by transit officers after they were stopped for deboarding a light rail without purchasing a ticket. Once a background check revealed that they were wanted for murder in Vegas, both were taken straight to custody. And this was the point where things got heated. The police found video of Sierra and Aaron's murder vlog on her phone. In these videos, they're laughing and making fun of the fact that they got away with Hal Seth's murder. <laughs> Welcome back to our YouTube channel. <laughs> Day three after <laughs> my Whoa! Don't put that on the camera. To justify her lack of sympathy for killing her beloved father, Sierra claimed that Hal Seth traumatized her by physically and sexually abusing her while he was alive. While no one knows if these claims are true, they were sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 22 years. Now that's a more befitting ending. Number seven, Zachary Davis. Did you kill your mother? Yeah. Why did you kill her? She uh, wasn't taking care of my family. August 10th, 2012. Zachary Davis, in a twisted state of mind, killed his mom with a sledgehammer and attempted to burn his house down while his older brother was still inside. Now, Zachary was a quiet boy who clearly had a history of mental illnesses. When his father, Chris Davis, died of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis in 2007, 
Zachary, who was just nine years old at the time, became mentally ill. This was coupled with the fact that his mother withdrew him from therapy. The family instead moved to Sumner County, Tennessee to move on with their lives. Or so they thought. His mother, Melanie Davis, worked hard as a paralegal and trained hard as a triathlete. She did her best to get past Chris's death and to keep her boys happy. But Zachary was slowly embracing his dark side. He often spoke in a monotonous whisper and would wear the same hoodie every day to school. He had this app on his phone about serial killers and another about torture devices. His notebooks were written with a lot of disturbing anecdotes, like can't spell slaughter without laughter, as well as some of the most disturbing things you can think about. August 10th, 2012. The voices in his head got the better of him. Zachary, his mother, and his brother Josh went to a movie together. When they returned, Zachary packed his clothes, notebooks, a toothbrush, gloves, a ski mask, and a claw hammer in a backpack. On the outside, it kind of looked like Zachary was going to run away from home. But on the inside, something far more sinister was at play. Melanie went to bed at 9 p.m., but when she fell asleep, Zachary went and got a sledgehammer from the basement and went into his mother's room. He bludgeoned her to death, striking her nearly 20 times in the head. Then, covered in her blood, he would close her door, walk into the family game room, and soak his clothes in whiskey and gasoline before setting it aflame. He shut that door and fled the house. So he had intended to kill his brother Josh in that fire, but because he closed that door to the game room, the fire didn't spread immediately, and the older brother was consequently awoken by the fire alarm. When he went to get his mom, he found her a bloodied mess, a sight that would traumatize anybody for life. Josh escaped the fire to a neighbor's house, while Zach was found by authorities nearly 10 miles away from home. In a videotape confession presented as evidence to the court, Zachary Davis chillingly explained how the voice of his late father told him to kill his mother. When asked by a detective in his confession if he could go back in time, would he still carry out the attack, Zach gave the answer no one expected. He said, I would probably kill Josh with a sledgehammer too. Now, if you thought that was crazy, this dude would go on laughing when he described how large and heavy that murder weapon was. He would laugh during an interview with Dr. Phil, describing the sound the sledgehammer made when it hit his mother's head. I could just hear the hammer hitting her head. And what did it sound like? It was this uh, wet thumping sound. <laughs> At one point in his trial, Zachary tried to blame the murder on his brother. Yeah, he actually tried. That claim shocked even his defense attorney, who admitted openly in court that Zachary Davis killed his mother. It was obvious this kid was not well, but neither the judge nor jury would buy the idea of handing him a reduced sentence. Zachary Davis was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. He barely spoke during the trial, but from the look on his face, this guy was not bothered by the verdict. Number 6. Sarah Johnson Guilty of murder of the first degree. Answer, guilty. Guilty on both counts of first degree murder. September 2nd, 2003. Diane and Alan Scott Johnson were shot to death in their home. The perpetrator of this act was their daughter, Sarah Johnson. Born on January 24th, 1987, Sarah was once daddy's little princess. Her parents spoiled her with luxury and gave her anything she wanted. The couple, Diane and Alan Scott, were high school sweethearts and were together for more than 20 years. They had a 22-year-old son named Matt, while Sarah was just 16 at the time. Seen as quite the popular straight-A student, she attended Wood River High School in Haley, Idaho. The Johnson family lived a perfect and happy life, until Sarah fell in love with a 19-year-old illegal U.S. immigrant from Mexico named Bruno Santos who was also a member of a drug gang. Santos wasn't a good influence on Sarah. Before he met her, he preyed on other young girls in the area, and this made the once sweet father-daughter relationship turn sour. Alan Johnson would go over to Santos' home one day and threaten to report him to the police if he didn't stay away from his daughter. At the time, Alan had found out their relationship was sexual, meaning that Santos could get statutory rape and get sent back to his country. But on the flip, Sarah became more and more rebellious, fighting her family over Santos, even having 
parents with him in her bed while her parents were out. Now one night Sarah had lied, saying she was sleeping over at a friend's place, but in reality she was at Santos' home. When her father found out the next morning, he went to pick her up and ground her indefinitely. Was that the right move to make? Who knows? But what happened next changed the life of the family forever. September 2, 2003. Sarah took the murder weapon, a 264 caliber bolt-action rifle from the guest house, walked right into her parents' bedroom, and straight up shot her sleeping mom in the head. She would then go into the bathroom and shoot her father in the chest. After committing both these murders, Sarah ran to a neighbor's house, completely clean, without a drop of blood on her. She would call 911 and tell the police that her parents had been shot by an intruder. The initial suspect was Santos being that he was a gang member. But later on, DNA evidence and her inconsistent stories sold Sarah out. She was convicted of their murder and days before her sentencing, Sarah addressed the court one final time. With the guidance of the Lord and the continued love and support of those that believe in me, March 16, 2005, Sarah was sentenced to life in prison. The prosecutors couldn't go for the death penalty because of her age, and after her sentencing, a psychologist analyzed her behavior and concluded that it definitely seemed a little bit off. And then have so little reaction afterwards simply shows me that she was just a stone cold killer. She eliminated by her second right hand. Number 5 Dylan Shoemaker. March 19, 2013, in Springville, New York, a boy named Dylan Shoemaker was taking care of his girlfriend Ashley Smith's two young sons while she was working at a restaurant. When the night was over, one of the sons was found dead, and Shoemaker was arrested for killing him. So what's the story behind this murder case? Well, for starters, Dylan was living with his mother when he met Ashley, and they began dating. At the time, Ashley was 18 years old, two years older than Dylan, and she also had two sons from a previous relationship. Along the line, Ashley couldn't foot her rent anymore, and Dylan's mom agreed to house her and both her kids. But that, my friends, was the biggest mistake she probably made. Once they moved in, Dylan became violent with one of her sons. He would beat the boy by slamming his head on the ground during diaper changes. He would place a pillow over his head and punch him repeatedly. And other times, he would slap him any time he disturbed his mother. These actions, repeated over and over again, left significant damage to the child's brain. March 19, 2013, Dylan went the extra mile to hurt the boy throughout the course of the night. By dawn, the boy had passed away, and by the time the cops arrived, Dylan was taken in for questioning. He confessed to hitting the boy in the head, and the autopsy revealed that he indeed died from severe brain injury. This led to Dylan's conviction. Now, during the process of his arraignment in 2014, Dylan foolishly made a phone call to his mom, telling her about his intention to use his age and his appearance as a white high school student to sway the jury in his favor. But this didn't work. On the day he was sentenced, Dylan Shoemaker turned to Ashley Smith, his girlfriend, and tearfully apologized, expressing his love for Austin and his regrets for what happened. I hate that what was done. I wish I could. I would give my life for Austin. <laughs> he was given 25 years to life in prison. After that sentence, Dylan cried uncontrollably as he was let out the courtroom. However, to his advantage, the Court of Appeals decided to decrease his prison term to 18 years to life, meaning he can start thinking about parole in 2031 after serving 18 years behind bars. Number 4. Daniel Petrick Speechless that was the reaction of Daniel Petrick during his sentencing for murdering his mother and attempting to murder his father over a video game dispute. Born on August 24, 1991, Daniel lived with his parents in Wellington, Ohio. His father, Mark Petrick, was a Pentecostal minister at the New Life Assembly of God, and his mother, Susan Petrick, took care of the home. 
It would seem they had a normal life, while Daniel never really showed any signs of being mentally unstable as a teenager. However, after Daniel suffered from a devastating skiing injury, their healthy relationship took a turn for the worst. Daniel became housebound as he was recovering from the injury. During this period, one of his friends introduced him to the Halo game series, which is kinda known for being violent. Daniel, however, would play this game for about 9 hours every day, to the point where his father would seize the game due to its violent nature and put it in a safe that also housed a 9mm Taurus handgun. Being that his mind was already accustomed to the violence depicted in the game, Daniel decided it was game over for his parents. October 20th, 2007, about one week after the game was confiscated, Daniel found his father's key to unlock that safe and stole both the game and the gun. Around 7 p.m. on the evening of the incident, Daniel walked up behind his parents where they were sitting on a couch and told them to close their eyes. Once they did, he proceeded to brutally shoot them both in the head. Daniel then placed the gun in his father's hand to make the crime look like a murder-suicide. Unlucky for him, his sister and her husband arrived at the house planning to watch a baseball game together with his parents. They arrived two hours earlier than planned, making Daniel panic. He denied him entry, but they forced their way in, meeting this traumatic murder scene. And you might have thought he'd kill him too, right? Well, for some reason, he didn't. Instead, he ran away. Daniel tried pinning the murder on his father, but since his father survived, the truth surfaced eventually. But it wasn't just the truth of what happened that shocked everyone. It was the fact that his father, whom he tried to kill, was pleading on his behalf for the court to grant him a second chance and a reduced sentence. If his pain did not run deep, I guarantee you I would not be standing here speaking on his behalf. I call him like I see him. And as you saw in the background, Daniel for the first time seemed truly sorry for his actions. Maybe for the sake of his honest and loving father, or for the sake of the multitude of people who came to support Daniel, the judge gave him the minimum sentence, which was 23 years imprisonment. He would be eligible for parole in 2030. Number 3. Tyler Hadley I'd like to direct this to my entire family. Um, I don't expect forgiveness, and I know that they, I know they will never forgive me. I'm not expecting forgiveness. July 16th, 2011. Tyler Hadley murdered both of his parents for the most ridiculous reason you can think of. Tyler's parents, Blake and Mary Jo Hadley, lived with Tyler and his siblings in Port St. Lucie, Florida. Now, during his teen years, his journey to becoming a mass murderer began when he started skipping school and doing drugs. His parents found out about that and enrolled him in an outpatient drug treatment program. But it only got worse. Tyler, not wanting to go for that program, engaged in a lot of arguments between himself and his parents. So, in a desperate attempt to escape attending this program, he decided to kill him. I mean, he could have easily run away from home or done something less diabolical than killing him, right? And to Tyler, it was a cool thing to do. A week before he committed that act, he divulged his master plan to one of his friends and even mentioned his plans to host a party the same night. Not a very smart idea, but he did. July 16th, when his parents came home early, he hid their phones, took three ecstasy pills, and began the carnage. While his mother worked on her computer in the living room, he would strike her with the back end of a claw hammer. Hearing her screams, his father rushed down to help, but Tyler attacked him with the same murder weapon. After he was done bludgeoning their bodies, he dragged the pieces into the master bedroom and cleaned up everywhere for the after party. About 60 people attended that party, proudly sponsored by Tyler's dad's credit card. Then, during this party, he confided in his friend, Michael Mandel, about what he'd done. Mandel went into the room, saw the bodies, and played it cool. He even took a selfie with Tyler. But immediately after he left that party, he called the cops on him, leading to Tyler's arrest the next morning. After he told me I didn't believe him, because he's been my best friend forever, I would never suspect anything like this before I could see Simon's blood. And that's when I went around back and 
expert. Tyler was a minor, meaning he wasn't getting death by Florida law. So, in turn, he was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. After hearing his sentence, he just nodded his head, stood up, and was let out of court. Number two, Jake Evans. Okay, what's the emergency? Uh, I just killed my mom and my sister. What? I just killed my mom and my sister. That's as close as we can get to knowing why Jake actually murdered his mom and sister on October 3rd, 2012. His desire to kill him came after he watched the horror movie Halloween. It's about a boy who killed his sister and then was admitted and then came out and killed everybody else. Jake was fascinated by this fictional character and decided to make it a reality. But before he did, Jake started hating his family. His sister Mallory made a racist comment that led to an argument. From there, he began seeing his family members as bullies, racists, and supremacists. Now these thoughts made him feel like he was different from them. They also added to that preconceived idea of killing his sister and mother. Now on the day he committed these murders, he wanted to kill his sister alone for that racist comment she made. He took a knife from their kitchen and put it in his pocket. However, he would change his mind and decide to use a 22 cal revolver that he had stolen from his grandfather's place. He then told his sister to come over and watch a movie with him. And during this movie, he made his move, shooting her dead. His mom heard the shots, came down, and got shot twice as well. Immediately after, he called 911, explaining what he had just done. Due to that call, the cops came right over and arrested him. April 2015, Jake was sentenced to 45 years imprisonment for the crime. And number one, Jacob Morgan. <laughs> that was Jacob Morgan's reaction to his 15 year sentence for involuntarily murdering his brother. And I use the word involuntarily for a good reason. March 2015, Jacob Morgan who has autism and developmental issues, accidentally started a fire at his family's home in South Carolina, resulting in the tragic death of his stepbrother Joshua. Jacob's parents maintained his innocence, explaining that he had been left in charge of Joshua while they were away and was asleep when the fire began. The prosecution argued that Jacob showed malice by not immediately seeking help or trying to save his sibling. In turn, Jacob's parents contended that neighbors had prevented him from returning to the burning house, and they claimed that Jacob had admitted to starting the fire under duress during a lengthy, unrecorded police interrogation. But the biggest mistake Jacob made was having inconsistencies in his statements about how the fire started. In the same year, Jacob faced a preliminary hearing where he broke down in tears, and he later pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter, unlawful conduct towards a child, and third-degree arson. He used an Alford plea for the arson charge, which meant he accepted punishment without admitting guilt. Originally charged with murder, Jacob's charge was reduced as part of a plea deal. Now, During his sentencing, Jacob expressed love for his late brother and wished he could have saved him in time. He had received 15 years, 5 for involuntary manslaughter and 10 for unlawful conduct, to be served consecutively. To his luck, his sentence was slashed in half and he was released in December 2022.